Good morning, good morning. Happy Thursday. It's been a couple of days since the read aloud, and I am happy once again to be back with you and presenting another book in the series of Author Perspective. Now, a couple of things for you to keep in mind as we read this book. I want you to think about, as you're reading the book, the topic, Meadowlands, why do you think that that topic of the book is important. Why do you think this specific place in our country is important to how we feel and how we think about the whole rest of the country and what we're doing? And then as we get towards the end of the book, how do you think about uh, how the author ends the book? Do you think it was a good ending? Think about kind of how the author ends the book. And uh, the author's name is Thomas F. Yazerski, and uh, this is a wetlands survival story, story of the meadowlands. Here we go. Right. Meadowlands. Oh, we have a little map here. It appears we are just outside of New York City. From the top of the Empire State Building in New York City, you can see a flat, wet place in New Jersey. Some people think it's just smelly swamps. Others think of it as where the airport or malls or stadiums are. Most people think it's not much of a place at all. This place is called the Meadowlands. The Meadowlands is an estuary where the Hackensack River empties into the Newark Bay. Much of it is wetlands with a mix of freshwater and saltwater soaking the spongy ground. When the Atlantic Ocean tide comes in, part of the wetlands are underwater. Hundreds of years ago, the Meadowlands was 20,000 acres of marshes, swamps, and bogs that were home to many different plants and animals. Humans lived there too. The wetlands supported the Lenny Lenape for thousands of years. They built wigwams on the surrounding dry upland. They fished in canoes with nets. They dug oysters out of the mud. With bows and arrows, they hunted ducks, rabbits, and other animals. They gathered many kinds of nuts, roots, and berries. Dutch ships first sailed into the Meadowlands in 1609. The explorers found an abundance of animals they could hunt for furs to sell back home. They looked at the Lenape as ideal trading partners. Settlers saw the cedar swamps and meadows as good for lumbering and farming. Soon, fences and farmhouses speckled the surrounding hillsides. This kind of reminds me of and still the turtle watched. Another story about just outside of New York City with things drastically changing. Through the 1800s, loggers cut down the meadowland trees. Farmers dug ditches to drain the land of excess water and filled marshes with dirt to add to their property. They laid wood planked roads through the meadowlands to get to New York, to get to New York bound ferries. Many Lenape died of diseases brought by the European settlers, and the rest were forced to move away. By the mid 20th century, that's the 1900s. The Meadowlands had been diked, dammed, and drained to control mosquitoes and drinking water. Plank roads had become highways, railways, and runways. 
Trucks and trains crossed the Meadowlands to ship goods from ports on Newark Bay and the Hackensack River. More and more people came to New York City by car or the highways and by plane through Newark Airport. Industries dug into the wetlands to be close to the rivers and rails that brought raw materials in and delivered, and delivered finished products to customers. They set up factories there to build new inventions. Their refineries turned oil into gasoline, as we learned on Monday, and gasoline into plastic. Power plants burned coal to generate electricity. Laboratories created chemicals to flavor our food and color our clothes. People working in the Meadowlands and living nearby use the wetlands as a wasteland. Factories poured chemicals into the Hackensack River. Towns along the river poured sewage into it and dumped garbage into the marshes. Cars, trucks, and planes and the factories blew smoke into the air. The garbage dumps grew into trash mountains, methane gas, from the trash exploded and burned. Creeks turned to poisonous and the wind smelled like paint. Fish and birds fled to find better places to live. Plants withered. By the 1960s, there were only 11,000 acres of wetlands left in the meadowlands. The Meadowlands had deteriorated into one of the worst places in America, and it was giving New Jersey a bad reputation. The state government decided to turn the wasteland into a center for housing, shopping, and entertainment, while protecting parts of the wetlands. In 1969, the state began to close the landfills and stop chemical dumping. Once the region started looking and smelling better, developers moved in. They covered the landfills and more wetlands with dirt and debris. On top of that, they built big stores, giant stadiums, houses, and apartments. In 1985, there were less than 7,000 acres of wetlands left in the Meadowlands. We see a trend here. Do we think this topic is important? You may not live in New York City, Think about this as an example. Do we think that this story is important? How can we apply the story to our own lives? But even after being dug out, filled in, run over and dumped on, the wetlands still showed signs of life. The Hackensack River still flowed south. The tide still rose, still rose north from the Atlantic Ocean. The river and tide still met at the Meadowlands twice a day as they had for 10,000 years. Because they did, the ecosystem had a chance to recover. All along the river carried little bits of dirt and dead plants called detritus from the hills. The tide brought little bits of plankton and algae from the Atlantic Ocean. As they pushed against each other and slowed down, the river and tide dropped their bits to the bottom of the marsh, fresh muck piled up every day. When chemical dumping stopped, the muck could slowly filter pollution out of the water and bury it under layers of new muck. Nutrients in the new muck could then feed seeds carried by the river tide and wind. The seeds grew into grasses and reeds, which also helped to filter chemicals from the water. Less pollution also meant the swirling freshwater and saltwater had more oxygen to add to the little bits of plankton, algae, and detritus. The oxygen helped bacteria in the water break down the mix into a nutritious soup for snails, worms, and insects. 
The reeds rattled and ticked and the wetlands buzzed with millions of bugs. The river and tide helped heal the meadowlands, slowly filtering out poisonous chemicals, absorbing oxygen, feeding plants and microorganisms. Tough little mumichogs survived the worst pollution, and now they have cleaner water and more small prey to eat. Healthy populations of small fish attract bigger fish, which come from the cold ocean during high tide to hunt the small fish and lay their eggs in the warmer, calmer marsh water. Among the cozy grasses, their young are safe from even bigger fish that might eat them in the ocean. When they have grown old enough, they ride the river current back to sea. When the tide starts to fall again, the river and creeks begin to shrink. Fish must flee to deep water or they will be trapped in shallow puddles. The falling tide is also like a rising curtain, exposing the muddy banks of the river and creeks and revealing more creatures that are thriving again in the meadowlands. This is the chance for the fiddler crabs to dance. Each male fiddler has one big clumsy claw. He waves back and forth, back and forth. He taps his pointy feet so quietly only a female fiddler crab can hear him. If she likes his performance, she will follow him home to his burrow in the mud. The water line flickers with rows of hundreds of yellow claws. What do we notice here? Yes, there's a lot of wildlife, but there's still evidence of humans that remain. At low tide, the salt water slides all the way back to the ocean. Creeks and puddles disappear, revealing mud flats, black soil 10 feet deep, stretching as far as the eye can see. Worms, snails, and fish that can't, didn't reach deeper water have nowhere to hide. The table is spread for shorebirds to feast. Yellow legs, sandpipers skip across the top of the mud flats. They chase insects on long legs and wide feet, or they pick up worms, snails, and fish <clears throat> with their pointy beaks. They don't mind the trains and planes as long as the meadowland provides them with enough food. Interesting. We do see evidence of humans back here, power lines and bridges. We heard about trains and planes, but as long so we are not disturbing this part of the ecosystem. We seem to be able to live together. Before the mudflats begin to dry out, the tide rolls back in to cover them up again. A ruddy duck's nest floating on the water rises with it, woven into plants growing in the water and riding it on the tide. The nest always stays hidden. A silky lining of feathers keeps eggs safe and ducklings warm. Stiff, dry reed stems form sturdy walls. The mother ruddy duck likes a spot with crowded reeds just off the shore and out of reach of raccoons that might steal her eggs. There are places for all kinds of homes scattered among the railroads and parking lots. With less pollution and new food sources, the Meadowlands is attracting more birds back to its sweat pants. Hmm. Notice again, in the background of all of these photos, hmm. at high tide again, fish swim freely through the marsh. With larger fish now able to survive in the meadowlands, the great blue heron and other birds of prey are spotting them from the sky. Bird migrating, birds migrating from Canada to the Caribbean islands can't find enough food to sustain them during their thousand mile journey. 
Most birds of prey that lived here until the 1940s disappeared with pesticides, weakening, weakened the shells of their eggs, and there were too few trees for building nests. They have now slowly returned, thanks to the Meadowlands, most powerful species, humans. We notice a chain reaction here, don't we? Small fish come back, then larger fish, and larger fish, and things that feed off of those larger fish, and ducks. It all started from the muck that was filled with more nutrients than it was with all the pollution. People in the Meadowlands have changed their views of the habitat. Karen is on a field trip with her class to a salt marsh. With her dip net, she catches three mimichogs and 10 grass shrimp. She learns that the variety of life in a salt marsh supports the world's fish and birds. She learns that the marsh algae and plants clean water and add oxygen to the air for humans. Karen's teacher explains, that the other ways marshes help humans, like soaking up flood water and keeping soil from washing away. Karen also learns how to take care of the wetlands. When she gets home, she'll recycle more and use less of everything, so less waste is dumped into the wetlands. She'll teach her family to conserve energy, to create less air pollution. You see, the cycle has come full circle back to us. Karen is not alone in helping the Meadowlands. Activists raise awareness about pollution and development in the wetlands. Federal, state, and local governments force polluters to clean up their mistakes and help restore wetlands. Businesses use cleaner manufacturing methods and sponsor conservation efforts. Volunteers clean up garbage and create friendly places for animals like nest boxes to attract them back to the march, marsh. In July 2007, for the first time in 50 years, a young osprey, a bird of prey, leaped out and took flight from a nest its parents had built in the Meadowlands. If a fragile family of ospreys can survive among these reeds and highways, other creatures can return and survive too. The Meadowlands is recovering, and it is inspiring people in urban wetlands all over the world to look for hope in this flat, wet, beautiful place. All right, so what do you think? about the Meadowlands. Now, this is a story from a state that is across the country from us. Do you think it's important? What can we learn from it? And how do you think about the end of the book? What do we think about that? With the author bringing it back to us humans and what we can do. What does the author want you to think or want you to do? Think about these things. I'll see you very soon in office hours. Have a great Thursday.